I think the people of this country have had enough of experts. The science has changed. If you count the legal votes, I we easily agree win. Go for a short it is time to, to get your bricks done. This candle smells like my vagina. I should be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. What the fuck is going on? Part of the Acast Creator Network. Hello. I'm Mark Steele. Welcome to my podcast where each week I ask the question, has he gone yet? No? Oh, what the fuck is going on? What the fuck is going on? Sometimes you have to simply watch in awe and wonder how it has happened that he is Prime Minister. This week he informed us no one had told him the party he went to was against the rules, although it took place at a time when he announced every night on television that parties were against the rules. Next he'll explain in detail, saying, I wasn't told the rules that I read out were rules. I thought they were a bus timetable or, or lyrics of a uh, song by Bruce Springsteen or instructions for erecting an IKEA CD rack. And then a series of emails will be discovered warning him that the party was against the rules. So he'll say, ah, yes, but they were in English. And at the time, I only spoke Klingon. So now he's trying to appeal to his backbench MPs by making new announcements every day, such as scrapping the TV licence. He'll tell us he's going to bring back fox hunting, but in indoor leisure centres so that it's more affordable for the average red wall voter. And then he'll say he's going to make it legal to use a Frenchman as an ironing board. And if that doesn't work, he'll promise his supporters that Michael Gove will wank him off in the car park while singing the national anthem. Then he decided to blame whoever he could to save himself. The staff or whoever forgot to tell him about the rules. By Wednesday he'll say the party in the garden wouldn't have happened if the gardener hadn't put the, the garden there. And, and it's the uh, ancient Greeks' fault for inventing wine. And so I've, uh, I, I've sacked the ancient Greeks and now let's move on. Eventually he'll blame the Queen. He'll say that she made him organise a party as she had too much cheese and hummus coming up to its sell-by date. And she hates waste. So now he's set off this war in the Conservative Party. Now some Conservative MPs have complained that they were being blackmailed by Boris Johnson's supporters. One of them, William Ragg, is actually going to the police to report his own party for intimidation. Tory MP Michael Fabrican answered this by saying, if I reported every time I had been threatened by a whip, the police would have no time left for other crimes. So that makes it all right then, as long as the illegal thing isn't just something you did once, but something that you did all the time. I'll try that next time I get a ticket for driving in a bus lane. I'll write back saying, you can't find me for that. I'll do it 20 or 30 times a day. So the Conservative Party is becoming like a scene from Goodfellas. Pretty Patel's probably going round and one by one growling, hey, listen, you didn't see no suitcase of wine from the co-op. There was no wine in the garden. Capiche. And David Davis quoted Oliver Cromwell at his old colleague Johnson saying, in the name of God, go. He'll go further this week and say, in the words of the Duke of Wellington in 1822, fuck off and don't come back, you useless lying twat. Then Rhys Mogg will appear at a meeting of Conservative MPs on a horse and call out, dost thou want a fat lib? Dost thou, or adibem labrum, as one would refer to such an injury in Latin? And the speaker will say, Order, 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 and the honourable gentleman should know it is not permitted for Gannon to be fired in the house. The member for Surrey East shall be allowed to finish his question without having to dodge shrapnel from a cannonball. And the next time a Tory MP defects, Nadine Doris will attack him with a flamethrower in the House of Commons and then say, it would be inappropriate for me to comment on whether or not I did set him on fire until Sue Gray has completed her investigation. And Boris Johnson will say, there is nothing in the rules to say that uh, setting an MP on fire is against the rules. And, and although it do, if it does turn out that it was against the rules, I certainly wasn't aware of that. And nobody told me at any time that setting an MP on fire 
was illegal and if he, he and if he does turn out that I was told it must have been during the time when I turned into a bear and I was hibernating. So I think he should stay for a few weeks. The country's stuffed, but we deserve some entertainment, don't we, in return? <laughs> We're very keen to be balanced on this podcast, so here is someone who has his own unique view on politicians lying. It's deceased cricketer Fred Truman. Liars, I mean, I don't call these proper liars. I mean, whatever it is, I didn't realise this was a party or I don't know. I mean, we had proper liars in my day. We had Richard Nixon. He could lie in his sleep. He would tell you that he had never met Frank Sinatra while he was talking to Frank Sinatra. And, I mean, if you didn't believe him, he would burgle your house. And if you believed him after that, I mean, then there was Judas. I mean, oh, he was a magnificent liar. I mean, he he was playing for a Galilee 11 against West Nazareth. Dickie Bird, the umpire, gave him out court and Judas said, I did not hit the ball. Denied him three times. I mean, eventually he was done for match fixing. I mean, it turned out he'd been paid 30 pieces of silver by a Far Eastern betting syndicate. <laughs> you know, then there was Chubby Arkwith. Oh, lovely man. Played in the Yorkshire League. I mean, he claimed to have discovered the lost city of Atlantis. He said he'd played a test match against them, took three for 27 with his left arm underwater spin balling. Got a mermaid leg before wicket. I mean, mermaids don't even have legs. That's how good at lying he was. Turned out he made the whole thing up and they had to reprint that day's Daily Telegraph because they had a report in it. Uh, that's what I call lying. I mean, nowadays, uh, yeah, they can't be bothered. I, I give up. Oh, what the fuck is going on? I have with me every week I say it's not possible to work out what the fuck is going on with our expert assistance. We have with us Russell Kane, ladies and gentlemen, and other creatures of the universe. Good evening, good afternoon, whenever you listen to this, good morning. Yes, of course. That's the thing. These days could be any fucking time, couldn't it? Not like the old well, days no. when they watched it when you no. commanded. Dinner on a tray on your laps, national anthem, everyone knew where they stood. They did. It would probably be good old days then. If you didn't sing the national anthem, the Bobby on a Beat come round and poked you in the arse with a lead pipe. Now, if you do sing it, Prince Andrew comes round and pokes you in the arse. He does. <laughs> do you think he insisted on her singing the national anthem? If indeed he did it, which, of course, we can't know until the trial. I don't know. It's like some sort of British squid game where every time the national anthem goes off, we have to sort of stand up and be silent while he runs off. Yes. Where we're so patriotic, we get, like, frozen. Oh, God. Yes, well, anyone who misses a word, that'd be the British squid game. <laughs> anyone who gets one word wrong... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they get covered with a hummus gun. You left, you communist <laughs> exactly. twat. <laughs> now, talking of the British squid game, I think Boris Johnson, is it a good thing that he's going to cling on? You know, if he clings on for another couple of months, he's clearly fucked now completely, but <laughs> a couple of months, would that be entertaining? I'm beginning to think that would be quite entertaining. Oh, th- there's something equally as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than being a maniac, and that is a pathological desire to be liked. <laughs> I know that because that afflicts nearly every stand-up comedian <laughs> I've ever met, including myself. So when people, as I'm sure they say to you, Mark, all the bloody time, you should go into politics. Yeah. You, you say the way you phrase stuff, you could really cut through. The reason we can never go into politics is we want everyone to be clapping the whole time. And yeah. if the room is clapping for capital punishment, hanging's coming back by the end of the week on my watch. <laughs> You know, it's populism is much more dangerous than being a maniac. I happen to think Ted Bundy probably would have steered quite a decent course through COVID. (laughs) It it would. (laughs) That is part of the issue is if you want to be liked all the time, it's incredibly dangerous. That's why Corbyn was so good, because everyone hated him. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good quality. He really nailed being disliked. He just took it a bit too far. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good quality. But should he hang on, was your question. Should he hang on? I do think that Bojo should take it to at least until we're out of the woods and all restrictions are off and this pussy hole Omicron that can't even hurt a man. <laughs> is, uh, it, it, we don't, we're not scared of that and we're just back to normal. Then he can leave. I mean, finish. The sh- don't just get to do the glamorous Liam Neeson part of the job where you kick the door open and start machine gunning Omicron. I have a particular set of symptoms. You need to do the shit admin bit at the end, clearing the tables away. Has anyone finished with these needles? Do that bit. 
and then fuck off. Oh, that should be a... But what about if officially that was it? So he was sacked. You had all the humiliation of being sacked, but he had to clear up everything, but he was given four months to do it. And there were cameras in the office all the time on a special channel, you know, like yeah. UK Gold or something. Yeah, the Hancock camera. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. <laughs> I watched that one a few times. It was a challenging wank, but I got there. Yeah. <laughs> It was hope for all nerds, all of us that were nerdy people that didn't even lose out. I didn't even lose my kiss ginity at school. And so while everyone was slamming Matt Hancock, I was like, do you know what? It proves even nerds get laid. Fair play. Yeah, I thought, I mean, I, that was probably the only thing he ever did that wasn't pernicious, wasn't it? A little bit of affection. Well, the, fa- the, the fake crime was good as well. You know, he'd, he'd learnt emotions. His species had learnt emotions and was seeing if they could act them out. The Hancock 5000 bot producing its tears. Yes. All right, here's a little quiz then. Which of these do you think were, were real? Do you think Theresa May's tears were real? Uh, I'm, uh, tears. Yeah, prob- prob- I think I, I do think... Are, are you asking me, can posh people cry? Um, I think posh people can cry, but <laughs> Theresa May specifically. What was she crying over? Remind well, me she, what she she'd was left, crying. didn't she? She got... Oh, yeah, de- definitely, yeah. Because you've got to remember, she would have been like a, at the... You know, I don't know what, St Paul's... School for girls, which is like a thousand pound a blink. Every blink is one thousand pounds, is important. So we teach the girls not to blink. Oh god, yeah, the slightly less rich ones would be just stood there probably... with their eyes wide open, <laughs> desperately trying to hold them open. She's probably been head girl, head prefect, triple A star, double first Oxford. These people have not known failure. Yeah, so yeah. it's a sort of crying for yourself, not captain of the hockey team anymore. Tears, I would have thought. But isn't that the same? Because now Al Murray told me a few years ago, it was before Boris Johnson was prime minister. He said that he did some sort of event somewhere and Boris Johnson was there and he was quite openly talking about how much he hated Cameron because of something that happened I can't remember what it was now but something that happened at, at Eton. That's my pig mouth you dirty bastard yeah, I've already used exactly. it. No one double dips on the pig mouth absolute rogue Christ sake we like to read Lord of the Flies while I enter the pig that's a ceremony. Say piggy only got to the second sentence, already mucked up the pig's mouth. Exactly. Yeah. It was just they were just no. They've always they were always competitive at school. Mate, it was a mm. school rivalry, college rivalry that went over into. From what I can gather, it was the same thing when they were at school. Cameron was the more successful, but Bojo floated on the side the more charismatic and drew the attention. And I'm trying to think of an equivalent. I suppose like Keith Moon, the drummer in the, in the Who. You know, like in the band yeah, where yeah. it's like one of the less talented ones is the focus point. There's not many bands like yeah, it. Yeah, like Bez with Happy Mondays. I mean, I've, you know, exactly. Like, yeah, things like things like that. Yeah, mm. the, the, they become the sort of lead singer, even though they've got the least skill. I think Boris has always had that sort of focus pulling clown thing, and Cameron's always like, oh, you know, I'm I'm the most successful one on paper. Why am I not getting all the attention? Even when I'm prime minister, they're still talking about it for fuck's sake. He'll be loving it now, won't he? He'll be loving. It. He'll be sat there every day. Come Come on, Samantha, let's see what the fuck has done now. Ha <laughs> ha! He was, <laughs> he didn't know the rules. No one told him the rules. Ha <laughs> ha! What a prick. That was crazy. The cheese and wine party. Saying I didn't know I was at a party is one step away from I was cuddling and my willy fell in. <laughs> now, I wasn't fucking my secretary, I was cuddling and my willy fell in. It's one step away from something lame like that. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, exactly. It was a workplace, workplace meeting. So, now. I heard you, I've heard you many times on many things, and one of the things I heard, and I've often quoted it, because I think it was very salient, is that a word, that we can use yeah. when you're from a comprehensive school? I think so. You can always use a desalientian if it's not. That's where you take the salience out. Is it? No. I made it, I made it up, it went wrong. <laughs> they probably do desaliation at the fucking schools these days with the woke fucking yeah, exactly. rubbish they learn rather than fucking proper things we used to learn, like how to get your head kicked in. Exactly. I'm not even allowed to walk in because I identify as a man. I'm banned from the campus. <laughs> right, here's a thing I heard you say. So, go on. It's probably wrong of me to quote it because I'm going to misquote it. So, it was that. I remember you saying that if you were to take someone who was maybe uh, a feminist activist from the 60s and suddenly bring her 50 years into the future to now, that you would look around at the issue of women's rights and think this is so much better and so on. We haven't got all the way, but a long way. The same if it was someone who was an anti-racist activist from the 1968 or something. The day after Martin Luther King shot, if you brought someone 50 years hence, they would go, wow, you know, we've had a black president. However, when it comes to class, they would go, if anything, fuck me, it's got worse. 
<laughs> no, I didn't mean materially. No, 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 no. no, no exactly. go, where's, the no. Car, where's the coal scuttle? What do you mean you push a button? Hang on, is it, I've got a massive sky telly. That would be great. Yeah, yeah, as yeah, they yeah. fired out their first kids, they would quickly realise that those children are more likely to keep the economic yes. status of their birth when they reached 18 than they were. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I.e., social mobility has declined. And I don't use the phrase white working class. I refuse to use it. I hate yeah, it. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, but There's working class people. I don't care what colour you are. You're either a fucking carpenter or you're not. So... I mean, it's not me. I'm not like being like a pub know-it-all. It's, it's a statistical fact. If you are born at the top of a tower block to a single mum now, or if you're born in a solid working class council house upbringing like I had, my odds were vanishingly small as comprehensive guy bought having my childhood in the 80s compared to my mum and dad's who had better odds of making it, even though they didn't. They had better odds than me. That's just a statistical fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I completely go along with that. And I think that was very, very accurate how you portrayed that, because that is remarkable. The feminists would, I think, they again, they would have a similar experience. They'd all be high-fiving each other for a day and then go, what happened to pubes, and then pass out. <laughs> <laughs> but so far as class, it's less complex. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I think the point, the point about the feminism is very, very complex. And, of course, anyone oh, vaguely reasonable thinks that it is brilliant that the gains that feminism has made and so on. In the, you know, when I was a kid, a woman couldn't even <laughs> sign a rental agreement for a washing machine or something. Or well, that, Crazy. Sadly, when I was a kid, probably washing machines hadn't been invented. But uh, <laughs> even leave it, even if you get over that obstacle... <laughs> was it called? I think they used to Mangle, a down. mangle. Oh, fucking hell, <laughs> I remember these things. Mother, how dare you sign for the mangle? Mangle mother, you know that's father's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I rented mangle. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, the issue of class, social mobility, is as. Uh, in fact, if anything it has got worse, because there was a movement at late fifties and so on, particularly you know arts and that, the angry young men, the playwrights, actors, people like that. Now the chances are much more skewed against you. So even in that acting, you know. Oh, I've got nothing against Redmayne and Cumberbatch and all that. They're all brilliant. Or journalists. I mean, partly it's just pure economic. You know, the, the, you don't get paid. So you have to be an intern for four years or something before you even get paid. So you have to be from a certain background. Yeah, but also, also just one thing I've, I've got to add is our industry is much better. Comedy, comedy panel shows, the presenting roles I'm in. I mean, I the, the shows I make myself. I bang the drum for diversity all along. I book people of colour across the gender spectrum. But what's interesting is the shows where I'm quite reasonably being told, you know what, we've already got Mark Steele on, Russell. We can't have too many like you know white old men swinging their dicks about. <laughs> the people saying that at the top that no one sees, Ollie, Monty and Jane running the channels. Yeah. I notice they're not phasing themselves out in favour of diversity. No, they, they don't. Although, How interesting be, is that? Although... Uh, to be fair, I should say that one of the reasons I don't get on as many of them things is because I took it literally when they asked me to swing me dick about. I know, I know, and I know. It was just it's very much frowned <laughs> upon these days on Gardener's Question Time. <laughs> oh, blimey, we've run out of time. Fucking hell, we'll have, to, we'll have to come back on and we'll have to carry this on. Part two. Yeah, 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 definitely. Part two. I was a really, really disappointing lack of swearing in that. I oh, know, what a pair of cunts. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, so... Finally, Russell, what have you got coming up that we should tell the good people of the population who listen to this? Well, it's a show I started making that's become like more and more relevant to the point where I get trolled every week when an episode comes out. About four years ago, I started a show called Radio 4's Evil Genius, where we take people from history, people that like Mother Teresa, for example, or Gandhi, everyone worships, and I let off three inconvenient, stinking, horrible fact bombs around these people and then mess with my normally incredibly <laughs> liberal and left-wing panel. And at the end, they don't get to say, well, I think it's more complicated than that. Life is full of nuance. <laughs> they have to vote evil or genius, cancel or keep. It was off the back of the whole Weinstein, yeah. can I watch a Harvey Weinstein movie or do I cancel every, You know, do I cancel the whole movie in my mind? You know, I said to Radio 4, my producer, let's, let's turn it into a game show. And when people say to me, yeah, but... I didn't agree because, like, we just, for example, had Prince last week. So I've been trolled to death because people are big Prince fans. You know, why can't someone be evil and genius? I'm like, you can, but we live in a world where say the wrong thing on Twitter and bang, you're gone. So I demand the right to turn it into an interesting discussion. Yes, And that's absolutely. what we do. Evil genius. We've done everything. We've done Charles Dickens, for example, uh, Gandhi, Prince, uh, rock stars, Freddie Mercury, Amy well, Winehouse. How did, how did Gandhi end up? Gandhi 
well, it, there was a bit of an argument. It carried on in the lift and out onto the street. <laughs> Police have been called to a fight that's believed to have been started over an argument about whether Gandhi yeah. was evil or we a genius. A partition, we had a partition in the studio. No, it went, uh, it went evil two to one. Um, right. So the person that was a, a Gandhi fan was not impressed. I mean, he was first wow. law, first law Gandhi ever passed that got through campaign and got through parliament. Do you want to know what it was? It was in South Africa and it went into the statute book and was put into action. And that was to have a separate queue at the post office for Indian and black people because black people aren't human and shouldn't be in the same queue. Mm. So the first law he passed is one of the most racist laws ever passed on planet Earth. And his chastity he tested every night by crawling naked next to his 19 year old niece, emerging the next morning and going, I didn't fuck her. And everyone clapped. <laughs> They were the two things that hung him on Evil Genius. So it's things like that. It's, it's really... Like, it's, it's brilliant. Like no, pub, it's a brilliant, it's pub, brilliant show. And it's... Uh, pub and facts. You can take down the pub yeah, and show yeah, yeah, off. But yeah, it's yeah. also you sort of get angry and debates start. So but also, it is, it. there is a sort of... Uh, I don't know, without sounding super bobbers, but it's a sort, it is a sort of satire on the way that things are complex and nuanced. It's a satire on cancel culture. We yeah, live yeah. in a time where... Nothing has meaning. You're not allowed to say A is B or sky is blue. Everything is shifting postmodern and everything's open to debate. Is this a microphone? It's whatever it wants to be. How can we live in that age and at the same time I drop the wrong pronoun and I'm cancelled without debate? <laughs> I mean, the two things are yeah, opposite yeah, 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 yeah. ways of being. Yeah. And we have both at the same time. Now, as a comedian to me, that delights me because there's humour in that yeah. paradox. Um, so that, and I also do one called Man Baggage, which you'll have to come on, Mark, because you owe me a favour now. Yes, but I'd love to. Where I get men to talk about the issues that women wished men would talk about. So every week we have a, why don't men, blah, 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 and, and the guys have to discuss it. It's in the male mental health space. So they're my two sort of radio podcasty things. I'm on all the, you know, the usual telly stuff and my, my sort of, I suppose, stand-up's the main thing. Come and see me do stand-up. And I do Channel 4 daytime as well, you know, with Steph. I love it. I've started, like, it was a lockdown job. I took it on. And I host segments going, how to stack your freezer more efficiently. Uh, now I love it because <laughs> it's weird how it's so easy for the likes of us to put humour into those things. Oh, yeah, so the, yeah, cam yeah. the camera comes to me and you, the gallery's like, go for it. And then, and it's like, you know, the old, remember old 80s telly where Lenny Henry would go wild and rip the cloud off the weatherboard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get to, I get to unleash yeah, that yeah, side no, of it myself looks, it looks every day. Brilliant. It looks brilliant fun. Oh, I'd love to be on things like that. On the shipping forecast, just sort of uh, suddenly <laughs> bourbon in the middle of what was going on in Finisterre. Yeah. Dogger, that's what your mum's doing. <laughs> Not really. Dog is going to be lovely. <laughs> Thank you very much, Russell Kane. This week, Adele announced that she's postponing her residency in Las Vegas because of an outbreak of COVID. And this has quite understandably annoyed some people, especially this woman who I heard on a radio phone-in. Oh, well, I'm sick of it, Jeremy, sick of it. She cancelled it only 24 hours before the performance. Well, luckily, I hadn't bought my ticket, booked my hotel in Las Vegas, or even booked my flights to Las Vegas, but that could have been me. Stranded in Las Vegas with no plans for the evening, and now I find out that Meatloaf has cancelled his tour. Luckily, I didn't have tickets for that either, but do I get a refund? No! They've probably given that money to someone who had a ticket. Oh, it's typical. So now Adele's not working. I suppose she'll be after universal credit like all of them. And who's going to be paying for that, eh? Me, as usual. Oh, I'm sick of it, Jeremy. And look at her crying. That's all she ever does. Crying about a divorce. Crying about her shows being cancelled. And why is she singing in Las Vegas, anyway? She shouldn't be singing in Spanish countries. She should be singing in England. She's blaming COVID, but that's all of them these days, isn't it? Everyone wants to be furloughed. I was furloughed for a year and a half. Got paid just for sitting at home. And who had to pay for that, eh? Me! Oh, I'm sick of it, Jeremy. Sick of it. What the fuck is going on? there are a number of other places where you'll be able to hear me if this isn't enough. Well, Mark Stills in Town is on BBC Towns. Uh, that's a podcast as well. A rival podcast with this one. They're probably getting terrible squabbles like your kids. And then there's my book, Who Do I Think I Am?, which is out as an audio book on Audible, owned by Amazon. So please, please do whatever you can to help them. 
Oh, also, and I'm still I'm doing the French show. If anybody wants to come along to that, don't come along if you can't speak French, because then it really won't make any. It probably won't make any sense if you can speak French. But that's at the Museum of Comedy on the 28th of January. That's next Friday, unless you're listening to this after next Friday, in which this bit is really, really irrelevant to your life. Now, various people have sent in all sorts of diverse messages saying these are the sort of things that we should be working out what the fuck is going on with them. At Mr. Darcy Dog on Twitter says, there's always a local angle to every story. This is from Stoke-on-Trent Live. This is brilliant. Apparently Stoke-on-Trent Live says, Meatloaf has passed away at the age of 74. Readers shared memories of actually meeting Meatloaf at Alton Towers back in 1987. That's brilliant where meatloaf meets stoke it's not a convergence that you would imagine it did bring to mind when david bowie died there was an article in the croydon advertiser that said local man delivered david bowie's milk in the summer of 1969 the milkman remembers the music legend as a nice man he ordered three bottles of silver top milk to be delivered every couple of days I think really, you know, we've all got, certainly for a certain age, very fond memories of Bowie and how he fits in with our lives. But I don't think I've ever met one that is so poignant that it brings to mind the summer of 1969 when you delivered his milk and that he was a nice man. Of all the tributes to Bowie, not enough people went, yeah, 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 Ziggy this and gender that and fucking dance things and soul, da, da, da. He was a nice man. <laughs> At Tatty Jacket says, uh, well, sends a link to a story about a dog that was saved from rising tide, right, by being lured by a drone. A drone dangled a sausage from it. And see, people knock drones. They go, oh, yeah, all right, I know. Every now and again, they murder 30 people at a wedding in Afghanistan. But on the other hand, look at the good they've done. See, it swings and roundabouts with new inventions. Um, Marvellous. At Jerry Hoopy House has sent that what the fuck is going on with this? There is a story in Carlo in Ireland where these local people took a corpse. There, I don't know if it was someone who they knew or had known, but they took him to the post office to try and collect his pension. Now, the whole tone of the article is how disgusting this is and various... This is the sort of changing nature of Ireland. There would have been a time when this would have been a charming little story. Ha, ah, the wee little old fellas with their little dead maid trying to collect his pension. But instead of that, Ireland has become part of the global network of judgmental sort of nastiness. Ah, oh, look at them, look at them, terrible people with the dead fella and he's collecting a pension. This is a brilliant thing. What are you going to get for a dead man's pension? 50 quid? That is surely, if someone said to you, will you and a mate dig up your dead mate and take him to the post office and try and collect a pension and we'll give you 50 quid? You go, that's not the rate for a job like that. But they went to all that trouble to create this sort of news content for 50 quid, 60 quid for a pension. They deserve it. They deserve 10 times that. If they called it a work of art, they'd have probably got thousands. If it happened in this country, clearly what would have happened under Ian Duncan Smith's rules is that the dead man would have been declared fit for work and he'd have had to go and get a job window cleaning. That's the trouble with the dead. They get money for being buried, but they're not prepared to work. They could easily be speed bumps in roads, saving the council fortune. But no, just me, me, me as other people sometimes say. What the fuck is going on? So the government has proposed that the licence fee for the BBC should be abolished. Now, I'm not an expert on the BBC, but luckily we have with us someone who is George Galloway. Let me put it to you, BBC. Your profligation of the tyrannically obtained licence fee is tantamount to the opulent lifestyle of Haile Selassie, the emperor, whilst the oppressed people of Ethiopia starved. Your payment of absurdly inflated salaries to the likes of Gary Lineker and horologist Steve Fletcher, who mends clocks on the repair shop, does you no credit. 
Your inefficient accounting system is personified by the daily debacle witnessed on Bargain Hunt, where neither the red team nor the blue team go home with a profit, having fretted away the licence payers' money on a Lalique ashtray. Furthermore, your thinly disguised support for the criminal Israeli government, as exemplified by the hairy bikers, whose enthusiasm for a crab souffle expanding beyond its ramekin, is clearly an attempt to justify the illegal occupation of the West Bank. Beggar's belief. That, BBC, is why I shall not be appearing on your channel, as I do not believe in broadcasting that is paid for by the state, a point I shall make eloquently on my weekly show on Russia Today. What the fuck is going on? Now, has anybody who has even attempted to begin to discover what the fuck is going on will testify? It is impossible to find out anything in that endeavour without enlisting the assistance of the young to find out what's going on in their world. And that is why some years ago, I bred someone who would be able to give us that help. And he's here now. Elliot Steele, hello. Hello. And once again, your enthusiasm propels us to new heights of inquiry, sir. It's, it's nice to be here. Yeah. I, just before we start, I think yeah, maybe you could get a job as breakfast DJ for Radio 1. I don't like how enthusiastic they are on those things because it's very false. It is very false, yeah. I don't like it. I feel like I'm being lied to <laughs> first thing in the morning. I think it would be quite good if you were breakfast DJ on Radio 1 with this sort of attitude. All right, half past seven. Well, just like, here's the song. This is Rihanna. Here you are. Here's the name of the song. <laughs> they never give you the name of the song either. It's annoying. With us is Marjorie. She's gone in for the competition. She lives in Plumstead. Do you want to win two grand? Of course you fucking do. Yeah, that's great. That's a way better way to start the day. It eases everyone into it. Not, hey guys, how's it going? So it's Monday afternoon here. Monday morning, sorry. <laughs> you can tell I've not had my coffee yet. Oh, fuck <laughs> off. Well, now, this is the big subject. You all know more about this than me. Drugs. Yeah. Sadiq Khan has launched some sort of pilot scheme... This is the sort of thing that when you're my age, you have seen this come and go seven or eight million times. Sadiq Khan has launched some sort of pilot scheme to make drug taking, drug possession a little bit less important than it was. Is this finally an attempt to make drugs laws a little bit more liberal and a little bit less archaic? What do you reckon? Yeah, he's not done it to any of the good drugs. He's done it to all the shit ones that no one really does anymore anyway. Like what? Well, like ketamine. <laughs> Is that a bad drug? Oh, that's great if you're like 17. But I, it's not. It's not really a drug. Nobody goes out and does ketamine anymore. It's not. It's, do you know what I mean? So like, that's the thing with drug laws. If you're over 19 and you do ketamine, you're pathetic. Grow up. It's a shame that nobody got up in the House of Commons and made this point. Oh uh, well, I did. This is the thing. Is it's like it's not really a law that they're to decriminalise drugs. Because the, the idea, it's so stupid that, like, if someone wants to go take ecstasy and the thing that's going to kill them in it is the impurities in it because now it's just made in some guy's bathroom, that it's, like, it's just stupid. They need to look at Portugal and what Portugal did in that. But Sadiq Khan isn't doing it for that. It's to free up police time. He wants to go, like, oh, here's more right. time for the police to deal with stuff. Do you remember years ago, they were like, we're not going to do anything with shoplifting anymore. So they essentially decriminalised shoplifting right. because of the amount of like crime in London. They went, if you're caught shoplifting, we do not give a shit. Like, don't call the police if someone shoplifts. <laughs> That'd be a great slogan. If you see somebody thieving, robbing, shoplifting, don't call the police. We're too busy. Stop crime. <laughs> But that, that's, that's pretty much what they did. They came out and were like, yeah, we're not going to prosecute. I know in LA they've got a rule now. Like, if somebody burgles your house and it's less than $900 worth of stuff they've taken, the police won't investigate it. Oh, God, do you think people... <laughs> do you think burglars go, right, how much do you reckon this is worth? I reckon it's worth about eight fifty. Right, OK, we've got 50... 
Would have had a coffee pot, add that in, 880, 90. No, I'll tell you what, these have gone up lately. That'll take it over the 900 and then we'll be in trouble. Yeah, that's that's pretty much what happened. The law should be that they have to leave an address because then the next day you could go around and take it all back. And given that now it's probably it's second hand, it's worth a little bit less, you could probably take it all back and maybe take a couple <laughs> of pot plants as well because it will still be under the $900. I think there's loads of new laws yeah. here that we're coming up with. And I think with your ecstasy, if it's the impurities, I think they should come in packets like everything else that you get in the supermarket, like a pizza, and it should have all the ingredients on. 3% monosodium glutamate, 2% people before you buy your ecstasy and go, oh, my God, look at the sugar in this and the calories. You, you can do that. You have to buy a test kit. Do you? So there's test kits that do that for you, yeah. What, and it tells you the ingredients of your ecstasy? It tells you, like, the purity and what it's been cut with. Oh, yeah. They do it with all drugs. But it's, like, a really good initiative, but the problem is is the government won't, like, fund it. Whereas, like, if you go to, into, like, Amsterdam and places like that, there's, like, machines in nightclubs where they'll test the purity of the ecstasy because then it means, like, it's harder for dealers to cut stuff with because they know people are going to test it. So it encourages the dealers to... Um, to make it like less dodgy then they can advertise it purer than yeah, ever could. before they could but the problem is is ecstasy is a class a with added banana <laughs> the extra ecstasy is um a class a drug so their own their yeah. new thing is for class b and class c so if you want to go sniff glue right go knock yourself out I mean, yeah. that's not what anyone's doing is it i don't know Nobody cares about glue. Well, I mean, I was very, very, you know, I led such, I've led such an austere. I've never really done any of these things. But I know some people, when I was a kid, they used to eat bird seed. What? Have you heard of that? No. Bird seed. Yeah. Oh, everyone started doing that when I was, no, it was, I, I missed bird the, seed. the generation of it. But the generation above me all started taking plant food, MCAT. Plant food? Yeah, yeah, plant food. But no, this this initiative by Sadiq Khan is, yeah. it's just kind of, it's one of those things where it's like, because he's probably one of the worst mayors of London there's ever been, in my opinion. Well, hang on, uh, given that the one before him has gone on to other things... Well, the fucking tubes worked when that cunt was running it. I'm not saying he's good in front of a cunt. He's not front of worse cunt. than Boris Johnson. That's he terrible. Is worse oh, by a fuck off. Mile. You can't say that. He fucking sucks. He's trying to be everyone's mate. He's trying to. He, oh, look, young people. I'm doing this thing. Yeah, drugs now. It's going to be like, cool. It's going to end up being like Berlin. No, it's not. It's because there isn't enough police because you can't recruit people. Crimes on the up because we're the West is a failing empire and we're in the middle of a decline and nobody wants to admit it. I have my issues with Sadiq Khan, but I'm not sure I'd blame him for the fact that Britain is a crumbling empire. That's not... not necessarily his fault, no, granted, <laughs> but like nobody in politics is coming out going, the West is failing. Fucking hell, what's this? Is this a bloody. Have you taken over from Osama bin Laden? The West is failing. <laughs> People used to say that when Bin Laden had a podcast. That's what got him it's, so he'd angry. He had, right. had a great podcast. You'd have listened to it. <laughs> I would have listened to it. Right. You know, apparently he used to play. He used to play this computer game. Like they found, he used to play this computer game called Counter Strike. Right. That means there's people. It's like an online game. And that means there'd have been people playing the game with a summer Bin Laden and just have no idea and like <laughs> chatting through comms with him and stuff and going, having fuck, no idea. fuck, fuck, People probably added him as a friend and would be like, oh, look, my mate's in line. And then one day they're just not on anymore and have no idea. Like, I wonder what ever happened to them. And it's because they were playing with a summer Bin Laden. And he was probably timed to his going, signal in this cave, fuck <laughs> rubbish. Right, that's all we have time for. I think that sorted it all out. Thank you, Elliot Steele. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. If you've liked it, please subscribe, rate it, and if you can be bothered, write a review. If you really, really can't be bothered, then definitely write a review. And if there's anything at all that you think I should be finding out what the fuck is going on with it, please send me a message on Twitter at WTF is going on pod at WTF is going on pod, and we will look at all the messages that you send. 
What the Fuck is Going On was hosted by me, Mark Steele, with my guests Russell Kane and Elliot Steele. Voices by Sarah Alexander. It was written by Mark Steele, James Serafinowicz and Pete Sinclair. Music by Willie Dowling. Produced and edited by Scott and Matt at Podmonkey. What the Fuck is Going On is a co-production between Podmonkey and Consec Industries.